I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Rachel Yehuda. Dr. Yehuda is a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, where she directs the Traumatic Stress Studies Division. Dr. Yehuda is an expert in stress and its biology. We talked a lot about what stress actually is, what the normal stress response looks like physiologically, what are the hormones and other things involved in that, how does it involve the brain, what brain regions are involved, and how does stress connect into memory. We discussed why we have a stress response and why that type of thing evolved in the first place. We talked about why certain individuals are more resilient to stress while others are more susceptible to it. We discussed stress-related disorders like PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder and what we know about it. We talked about the standard treatments for stress disorders like PTSD as well as new treatments that are emerging including MDMA and the use of psychedelics to treat these types of emotional disorders. We also touched on some research to do with intergenerational trauma, how stress can actually be transmitted from parent to offspring and and what some of the different possible mechanisms involved are there. And we talked about epigenetics, how changes to DNA that don't actually alter the sequence of DNA, but alter how it's expressed can impact things like stress and PTSD. So if you're interested in stress and trauma and how stress can lead to things like PTSD and what the underlying physiological changes are and what the underlying brain mechanisms are, this will be an interesting podcast for you. So I hope you like it. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing on the Mind of Matter podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to the podcast wherever it is that you're tuning in. Please also check out the Mind and Matter Substack at mindandmatter.substack.com. You'll find the podcast in all of its formats there, as well as my free weekly newsletter and some science writing that I produce based on the content that you hear on these episodes. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mind and matter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Rachel Yehuda. Dr. Rachel Yehuda, thank you for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Can you start off by just explaining for everyone who you are and what your scientific background is? Uh, sure. My name is Rachel Yehuda, and I am a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I'm also the, um, the director of mental health at the James J. Peters VA in the Bronx. So are you, um, are you strictly a research scientist or are you also a physician? I'm not a physician. I have a PhD in psychiatry and neuroscience. And um, my, I would say clinical work is more clinical administration. I see. Uh, yeah. And so can you just describe for everyone what your lab studies at a very basic level? What are the, what are the big questions you guys look at? 
Well, the big questions that our lab has looked at over the years has been really the questions that involve why we respond so differently to stress and trauma. It's, it's really been a fascination of mine. Um, the idea of the stress response when it was initially discussed by Walter Cannon and then Hans Salier and all the greats was that the response in people and animals would be very predictable based on the characteristics of a stressor. And it turns out that um, that doesn't seem to be the case very often. When you talk about traumatic experiences um, in people, you see really wide ranging um, types of responses. And this became a real question when I first heard about post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which I had heard of after I had already been studying the biology of stress for many years, and certainly through my uh, graduate work and my postdoc. But, but uh, post-traumatic stress disorder was meant to be uh, a condition that was described based on the experience um, to a, a highly traumatic event. And the idea was that we needed a diagnosis because um, there wasn't a category that explained long-lasting and enduring responses to very large events. And the paradigms that we had that could explain stress responses that were more universal generally were um, thought to be less uh, <laughs> of less severity than the ones that were um, kind of these horrific big cataclysmic events that are associated with trauma. Um, the, 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 the models of stress told us that um, people and also animals um, respond to stress in a pretty uniform manner, the fight or flight response, in which there are very predictable brain areas that are activated. The amygdala senses danger from the environment, doesn't, doesn't interpret it yet, but immediately, just to be sure, initiates a cascade of responses like the startle response and activation of the sympathetic nervous activity to release adrenaline, and of course, suppression of the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and also the release of the, uh, the stimulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis to release cortisol from, from the adrenals. And um, what stress theory told us was that in concert, these, this coordinated response allowed us to fight if the situation warranted it, to flee if that situation <laughs> what warranted it, um, sometimes to freeze, which tends not to be the best response in all circumstances, but is definitely an option. Um, but after the threat is gone, um, there is a recovery period that, the, that is also part of the coordinated stress response in which the hormone cortisol principally is responsible for helping us kind of come down from the adrenaline response, from the sympathetic nervous system effects, because when the body's no longer detecting threat, and it's made its response, it can begin a process of recovery. That's pretty universal. Um, and I think it is universal when we're talking about the acute response to stress and even the acute response to trauma. But the when the diagnosis of PTSD occurred, um, people defined what PTSD was as kind of a normative response to very, very unusual events. And it was really meant to say that the response to a trauma may be more severe and long lasting than the response to the kind of stress that is um, a stress that one normally recovers from. Um, and it was a little bit of a circular argument. We need, we need to define this because there are people here <laughs> that have had traumatic events uh, many, many years ago and the war is over and, or the assault happened many years ago. And they're still having a lot of the same symptoms that um, reflect having been exposed to stress and sometimes even symptoms that feel like a fight or flight response to a memory or a trigger. Um, but, what, but what we didn't know at the time that PTSD was um, coined was we didn't know the prevalence. 
we didn't know that most people who are exposed to trauma would actually not develop PTSD. And even though trauma is very common, and so PTSD is very common, and so this is a very big public health problem, and a very big mental health problem. Um, it was a little bit of a scientific mystery to try to understand why only a proportion of people who are exposed to this kind of an event would develop symptoms. And so from the perspective of a stress researcher, that meant that there was more to the response to stress than simply a straight biologic, um, a biologic response to a threat that is put in front of you. Mm -hmm. I would like to, um, I'd like to dwell for just a couple minutes on what we might just call like the normal canonical stress response for people to help them understand the underlying biology there. So, so you mentioned some interesting stuff in animals exposed to a stressor. There's obviously going to be a sensation of a detection of the stress. There's going to be some brain areas that are key brain areas involved. You mentioned the amygdala and the hypothalamus. What is this hypothalamic pituitary access? And what exactly is happening in a normal sort of healthy, uh, average stress response? And you know, what are these things like cortisol and these other molecules we might talk about doing at a, at a molecular level? Well, I'm not sure how useful it would be to talk about the molecular level, but I think what would, would be useful is to understand that when the, when the brain detects threat, it may only have a very, very short time. Uh, to coordinate a response that will save its life, right? So the hallmark response would be to maximize the amount of adrenaline um, that is going to be released. Adrenaline will cause your uh, adrenaline causes your heart to pound <laughs> out of your chest, for example, but it causes you to sort of really mobilize so that you can do kind of super human things. And we've all heard about those stories of, of the child that goes under a car and the mother lifts that car somehow up <laughs> so, that, so that the child um, can come out, but under normal circumstances, that mother's not lifting that car at all. So it's really the mobilization of all the energy in one place so that you can do something that you don't normally do. And is that, what, is yes. that like, is adrenaline just allowing a maximum amount of oxygen to reach cells? Is it having some effect on like ATP recycling or anything like that? Yes, yeah, doing a lot of those things. And it's also doing that also in coordination with um, halting activities that um, are done with, by the parasympathetic nervous system, such as digestion or um, ovulation or the things of tissue repair, things that your body does on a routine basis. And it's facilitated also by the release of cortisol, which definitely helps with, with uh, mobilizing some of that energy. I see. But the so, interesting, so yes, go ahead. Adrenaline is, is kind of shifting, shifting the economy of the body so that you're only and especially doing the things that you need to escape the stressor or do whatever you need, like lift the car. And it's actually taking energy away from these other things. Right. It's not directly taking energy from it, but yet that is the net effect of what's happening because there are um, the amygdala is actually initiating several simultaneous processes. Hmm. So it's commanding one system to be on go and another system to sort of be more suppressed. So it's kind of a coordinated ballet that results in um, being in a maximum capacity to provide a response to an unusual challenge. We're, we're actually built this way. I see. Yeah. And, you know, I would imagine, you know, we're going to talk, I think, about the difference between acute and chronic stressors. I would imagine that you know the system is really built for and evolved for acute responses so that if you have this kind of response um stay on chronically that would actually be bad because you said you know if you're if you're sort of tuning down uh digestion and ovulation and all these other things immunity that if you did that for too long that would actually start to have a detrimental effect exactly right so um the the system seems to have evolved to deal with these short-term kind of predator is after me type of situation um, where I need to think quickly to, 
to save my life and of course to save my ability to pass genes to the next generation type of thing if you go for an evolutionary biology perspective but it's a very conserved response um, uh, you could see it in in many organisms and certainly in humans and um, it's really designed to help us and even the part where cortisol is released cortisol does many important things during stress um, but also helps the shutdown process of stress so ultimately the release of cortisol operates through a negative feedback inhibition where um, once there is no more threat the high levels of cortisol um, feed back onto the pituitary and the hypothalamus so that the system is shut down and also inhibits the sympathetic nervous system activity to bring down the adrenaline. So, you know, almost everybody who's listening to this podcast is familiar with that fear <laughs> that sends your heart pounding, the near miss on the highway, um, whatever it might have been, um, where you really have a startle response and then your heart beats for a while you don't really until you kind of know that you're safe um and then now that you're safe somehow allows you to not have your heart beating out of your chest anymore um, the release of adrenaline also does something else that is very important it helps with the formation of the memory Mm. And this is a very important adaptive feature of the stress response because um, you want to remember things that are stressful. You want to remember, for example, if you were assaulted in a bad neighborhood to avoid that neighborhood. Um, and so even animals want to um, avoid places where they were shocked or where they might have had some kind of a, a situation um, befall them and the idea of stress is so in, embedded with learning and memory that the way that you actually study learning and memory in a lab is very often by shocking an animal by stressing an animal so these concepts of stress and memory are really very intertwined but they're not meant to um, torture you they're meant to educate you mm -hmm. So that is the on the fundamental adaptive level where the world is the world and there are always going to be um, it's always going to be necessary to respond to certain challenges and we're built to respond to them. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're saying and and I don't I don't think I knew this. I don't think most people know this. You know, when we say cor you often hear that, you know, cortisol is the stress hormone, but it sounds like it's not it's not the cortisol makes you stress. It's actually evolved on on the opposite side, on de-stressing you after the threat has passed. It, it's both. Um, mm. but yes, it's certainly involved in the latter. And that's what what made me truly understand this um, was when we started to study post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. And the, our initial finding was that combat Vietnam veterans had lower cortisol levels than uh, patients in other psychiatric groups, and then ultimately lower than combat veterans without PTSD and people that had not been exposed to combat at all. And that was seriously a mystery. Like, why would these guys have lower cortisol levels if their outward behavior and symptoms suggested that they were under stress and certainly their verbal assertions and it was very clear and so what would that be all about and so it really required a deep dive into um some uh you know other investigators that had looked at this and so you know the idea of cortisol really is to be part of the stress recovery as well um, but sometimes we confuse the stressor that is the thing we don't like with the stress response, which is really meant to enable us to function during stress. So you can have stress, you can have a stressor, you want to be able to mobilize a stress response. And what we ultimately came to learn in PTSD was that maybe if you don't have 
a sufficient cortisol response at the time of a trauma, this can actually make you more vulnerable to developing PTSD because it keeps your adrenaline levels higher. And if your adrenaline levels are higher, what happens? You're in distress, you're still in the fight or flight mode. And even though the stressor is gone, your body isn't acting like the stressor is gone. So your mind says, I must still be in danger. And so when you're distressed, you begin to also think about other triggers in the environment as potentially dangerous. So if you're, if you're having a traumatic memory while you're in your house, you might come to feel that your house isn't a very safe place for you. Mm. And so you, you get into this loop where because your stress response wasn't contained um, properly in real time, um, you have an adrenaline, adrenalinized body and your mind seeks to interpret that, well, maybe I'm not safe. Maybe I can never be safe. And it kind of feeds forward onto itself and begins to affect um, your brain circuitry as well. So this idea of being able to calm down after a stressor, to be able to say something like, okay, that's over. I'm, I'm still here and I'm alive, um, is a very important part of um, how you're going to do with long-term stress recovery. Mm -hmm. And that's just acute stress. I mean, you mentioned chronic stress. Chronic stress is something different. Chronic stress is that the challenge just isn't going away. And so I like to think about the stress response. It's, it's a little simplistic. It's okay. It's not 100% wrong. I like to think of the stress response as having this accelerator, which is the adrenaline, and cortisol being the brake, right? But with chronic stress, for, to me, it seems like that's like riding on the accelerator and the brake at the same time <laughs> uh, because you're, you're constantly demanding of your body to make these hormones. I'm under stress. I need more adrenaline. Okay, that means I need more cortisol. And it, it goes on and on and on. Now, eventually, um, the system can't take it. That's where you start getting stress-related disease because... Mm just there's too much cortisol to, um, to be able to um, fight off the um, inflammation. And that's also where you get um, uh, a lot of long-term mental health consequences as well. Ultimately, the adrenal might get tired, and that's called adrenal exhaustion. So ultimately, after having a lot of chronic stress, um, the system actually rewires itself to have lower cortisol levels, um, but it still may have increased adrenaline levels that can also contribute to, to disease. I see. So, yeah. Before we get into some of that, uh, you know, I want to dissect some of the biology that, you know, some of the stuff that's going on under the hood in someone with PTSD, but I want to talk first about, you know, it sounds like what you, based on what you've said so far, that there's actually a a fair amount of what, what might be perfectly natural biological variation in how different organisms, different individuals, stress responses actually work. And, you know, how can you, can you talk a little bit more about how variable the stress response is in a, in a population and what some of the, the key nodes in the stress response that vary actually are? So theoretically, the stress response is universal, right? So in theory, we should all be having a very similar response. But in the real world, we come to stress having been alive for the moments, hours, years <laughs> before stress. And a lot of what has happened to us before might affect the quality of the stress response that we're having in real time. So for example, if you've been stressed before, that might result in either a sensitization um, or an immunization, depending on the outcomes. In a sensitization response, the current stress dose might be um, pretty low, but you might have an exaggerated response to it because you're carrying the memory of a prior time that you felt activated and you're bringing it in so that you have a hyper response. 
you can also have a different response. You can have a response of, oh yeah, that, been there, done that kind of response where you've, you're more immunized. Um, so that is sometimes it's called stress inoculation, that because it's not a new thing, the novelty is gone. You have, um, you, your body treats this as something that you know how to deal with because the outcome last time was okay. Mm. And so I can manage this. So you can get a little bit of variability based on prior history. The other factors that contribute to variability in the stress response is um, whether your perception ultimately of the stressor is that it's predictable or controllable or any of those uh, variables. So um, if you can say things to yourself like, okay, if I just do X, I can control this a little bit. Or if I run there, I won't, I won't um, have this challenge. Then um, those are all things that can kind of affect the magnitude of the stress response that you're having. And then right after the acute challenge is when you have the most opportunity to, um, to, to sort of imprint on whether a stress response will be long term or short term or adaptive or maladaptive. Because in the long run, you, your ability to be able to calm down and to contextualize what happened um, is really going to be um, very key. Uh, so, you know, when, when a child uh, falls down and hurts themselves, right, they cry, and they want their mommy or their daddy, right? Mm -hmm. And what instinctively many parents do is they pick up their child and they say, okay, it's going to be okay, that always going to go away. Well, what are we doing? We're soothing the child so that the child comes into the here and now and isn't staying in the past of, of the pain, but is sort of recognizing the pain is going to go away. It's not going to hurt as much in a minute. All those things will be true, <laughs> right? If, um, if you let the stress response pass. Now, some parents um, really get a little hysterical when their child is injured, right? And so the hysteria that a parent may express at the time a child is injured may actually prolong the stress response mm. and may prevent a child's natural recovery. Uh, so no matter how distressed you are when an accident occurs with somebody, especially a child, um, you should try to keep it together because you're actually your response may actually serve to modulate somebody else's response during a trauma. So this idea of keeping calm under pressure um, is a is a is a valuable stress regulator if you can do it i see yeah that, that makes a lot of sense i mean i immediately start to think about their um sociological changes that have happened over time um some time ago i saw an image you know one of those images we've all seen something like this and it was from like you know the 19 teens or the 1920s and it was a children's playground in new york city and it was remarkable because the playground was just there was there was no sand there were no wood chips it was just a concrete <laughs> floor and there was just metal ladders and jungle gyms and they went very high and you saw very small children with no parents around and they're hanging upside <laughs> down and they're doing all these things that most parents would never allow their children to do today and i guess my question yeah. here is to what extent do you think um things like you know uh, what people might call helicopter parenting or coddling children what effect does that have on the development of a child's stress response? And, and is it going to be consequential for them into adulthood? Well, the important thing to say about that is that um, a lot of scientific studies have demonstrated that exposing children to kind of manageable doses of stress when they're younger will um, is a form of stress inoculation. And so allowing somebody to actually cope with some adversity, mini adversity, when they're younger, builds that muscle. And so um, it is important for, for a child to be able to feel adversity and also know that that, that response won't continue. Um, that's better than a child never being exposed to anything. Because when adversity then comes um, later on in life, it could be a totally bewildering experience. 
So this idea that you're going to fall off your bicycle or skin your knee or break your arm, you know, in the long run, it's it's teaching you in a very real way how to cope with an, a non-perfect situation. Um, and that is going to prepare you very well. Now, if the outcome of the adversity is negative, right, if something bad happened and then something even worse happened, right, you're not going to get inoculated. So that's going to be, um, that's going to be very, very difficult. So you want to just have the right dose. And so, you know, it's, it's really important that children do learn how to cope with certain things and, um, and learn what the right coping responses are, including um, that grace under pressure may serve them very well in the long run. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm hearing so far is that there probably is this kind of innate, um, very, very stereotyped physiological stress response that is nonetheless um, moldable by experience and, and gets tuned by our experience as we develop and go through life such that there is a fair amount of variation between individuals in terms of how sensitive or how resilient they are to different stressors or stress in general. And then that sets the stage for, for example, certain people being more or less susceptible to things like PTSD. Is that, is that a fair summary? Yeah, I think it's fair. I think that wh when you talk about susceptibility to PTSD, um, childhood factors are certainly um, important, but a very big part of recovering from PTSD has to do with what happens right after the trauma and whether you have the right kind of social supports that will help you kind of deal with what happened and not stay in your own mind to catastrophize and kind of keep the distress up. And so if we, if we start talking about PTSD now, what, um, I think we all have a, an intuitive notion of it, but I think it would help. Can you just kind of give the formal clinical definition of PTSD and then start to talk about some of the major, the major physiological markers that we see in terms of what the stress response and, and what the brain is doing? Okay. Um, in a nutshell, uh, PTSD is really... Um, a condition that occurs following exposure to extreme trauma in which it almost looks like there is a failure to recover from the acute effects of a trauma. It, it, it kind of looks like that. I, we, we're not really sure physiologically if it's, if it's only that because we think there might be risk factors that explain some of these responses. But a person that has PTSD will first and foremost um, be haunted by the memory of a trauma. Um, this memory can come invited or uninvited. Um, they'll they'll um, just come as intrusive thoughts or nightmares. Uh, but basically, somebody is trying to do something else, and it's almost as if uh, your mind is um, a big remote control. You're on a different channel, and then there is the traumatic experience. And it's hard to get out of your mind. And so that's what can happen when, when reminded of the event, you can get physiologically triggered in such a way to even look like the fight or flight response is occurring over again, or you can be very psychologically triggered. But it's really this idea that the memory brings distress with it. Um, we think that part of it may be because there's too much adrenaline at the time of the trauma. And so when, instead of just having a memory, the adrenaline be, be responsible for forming a memory of trauma, but not necessarily rearing its head every time that memory is, um, is um, elicited. In PTSD, we think that the memory comes hand in hand with an adrenaline response. Um, so people who uh, who are exposed to trauma and who are triggered and who have intrusive memories really try very hard to avoid those memories in some way. Um, they either um, uh, try to avoid reminders of what happened to them or they restrict their lives so that they won't have to um, come confront any kind of a traumatic reminder. And so avoidance is a very big part of PTSD. 
Then, of course, there are these incredibly physiologic symptoms, PTSD, that's maybe also because of the adrenaline. Um, people have difficulty sleeping or concentrating. They have um, very um, exaggerated startle responses and hypervigilance. Um, so uh, that is something that you definitely see in people that have PTSD as well. Um, anger is part of the hypervigilant, is part of the hyperarousal response. And then um, in the DSM-5, they added a fourth category, which are changes in mood and cognition. And this refers to the fact that people that get PTSD really do experience a change, not only only in their mood, not only do many people become more depressed or anxious, but also in the way they look at the world. So for example, you can become more nihilistic. Um, you can decide that the world is too dangerous for you to be part of. You could decide that you're just incompetent because you were not able to prevent the trauma or behave a certain way. And you could also decide it's all your fault and carry around a lot of shame, guilt, and blame. And um, Therapies for PTSD uh, that are the cognitive behavioral therapies are, um, you know, do very well in addressing these aspects, the, the mood and sometimes the um, cognitive distortions, depending on the circumstance. But that's what PTSD is like. So it ends up having a gigantic effect. Uh, first of all, PTSD often provides a ripe environment for um, mood disorders. Um, sometimes you have TBI if you're exposed to a physical trauma. Um, substance abuse is very common in people that have post-traumatic stress disorder. And pretty soon, it's a very big problem. Um, it really takes a toll on family relationships, work environments. Um, and so, you know, you can look intact, you can look like your old self, <laughs> but inside you're really battling a lot of demons and you're really struggling quite a lot when you have PTSD. It's not to be taken lightly. And I know that you've done some work for how things like PTSD and chronic stress tie into aging and mechanisms in the body that have to do with how aging is happening. And so what are we learning there in terms of that relationship? So the PTSD aging story turns out to be very complicated, and it's also um, not that clear. There's there's a, a little bit of um, there, there are a lot of different opinions about what happens. Um, one idea is that PTSD results in a premature aging. Um, there seems to be some evidence for that in some of our work, actually, um, with um, telomerase, we're part of a big consortium where we're looking at telomeres and telomerase activity and also epigenetic aging. Um, you can kind of get a sense of um, the uh, methylation clock and in people that have PTSD, their methylation age is a little older than their uh, chronological age. So there's definitely evidence for some processes like that. Um, I first started being interested in aging uh, because there was this paper that came out in the 90s showing that hippocampal volumes were smaller in people, in some people that had um, chronic PTSD. And, um, you know, in normal aging, high levels of cortisol that is starts to be released as a function of normal aging was thought to be responsible for normal hippocampal atrophy and concomitant memory disturbances that you see in older people. And I kind of wondered also whether having a smaller hippocampal volume um, as a result of trauma, what that might look like when you age. I mean, would, would it keep getting smaller and smaller? And also, since PTSD was associated with low cortisol, like with that, be protective in some way? I mean, how would that work exactly? So we did a, a series of studies in World War II veterans and in Holocaust survivors where we looked at memory very carefully. We looked at brain imaging. And we concluded that in normal age, in, in, in aging trauma survivors with PTSD, 
their hippocampi are not smaller compared to demographically matched controls. Um, now, if anyone has a right to have a smaller hippocampus as a result of trauma, it would be a Holocaust survivor because the trauma was so severe uh, over such a prolonged period of time. It, ha it occurred with food deprivation, many other things. But here we were looking at 70, 80, and sometimes 90-year-old people, and um, their hippocampi were not smaller if they were Holocaust survivors or World War II veterans. They had some impairments in cognition um, that we thought was an age-related decline, but I'll tell you how we proved that it wasn't in a minute. Um, but we came to the idea that it's possible that um, when it comes to PTSD, it's not that the hippocampus continues to become smaller, that there, there is probably um, a process whereby if the hippocampus becomes small as a result of trauma, as a result of normal aging, that process may actually um, go a little slower. And in fact, you have a lot of trauma survivors. In fact, there are many Holocaust survivors still alive today that are very, very old and cognitively intact. So there could also be things about having low cortisol or having had an injury early on that gives the body a chance to also recover. Um, we thought initially that Holocaust survivors and aging World War II veterans performed worse for their age on cognitive tests. Um, and when we did kind of the normal cognitive tests, um, the, the, a normal kind of cognitive test would be um, like to ask you to remember words that are paired and unpaired, like uh, plate and fork would be an example of a paired um, word, but fork and mountain would be an unpaired word. And one of the first age-related deficits is in learning to form new pairs of unrelated material. And so both Holocaust survivors and World War II patients showed that then we did something very interesting. We put in trauma words as the unpaired word from people's own narrative. And we found that they actually could learn those words better. So for example, instead of saying fork mountain, which totally doesn't make sense, we might ask them to learn, you know, fork uh, fire or fork um, starvation, or something that really pertained to their individual experience. And so it wasn't that they couldn't learn those words, they were learning them better. And so what we decided was that what happens as you age in PTSD is very complicated, but some things are definitely preserved at the expense of others. Mm. So physical health absolutely deteriorated, which is consistent with the telomeres story and also consisted with the methylation clock story. Um, but some things are, are more preserved, you might need them, you might need an ability to um, respond in certain ways. And with respect to PTSD symptoms, they tended to get less over the years in the same people, we were able to do five, 10 year follow ups. And so we were able to see that it's not like your PTSD stays at a peak. Um, one Holocaust survivor said it very um, well to me, you know, it just becomes a part of who I am. It's not a symptom anymore. <laughs> so um, that kind of says it all. So yes, there are long-term aging effects. Not all of them are bad. Some of them are. And I think that that could be said about trauma responses at every stage of development. A trauma response is the body's way to help you through the trauma, but sometimes it can only help so much and can help in one way at the expense of another way. I see. And can you give us a sense for how common it is, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, a combat veteran or a Holocaust survivor, in general, how common is it for genuine, like diagnosable PTSD to spontaneously go into remission, meaning, you know, the person overcomes it and, and is no longer diagnose, diagnosable without any sort of external um, clinical intervention versus how often the opposite happens. It's very common in the first two years following 
um, a trauma exposure, or let even say maybe first two or three years. So in the beginning, that is in fact the normal pathway recovery. You could start out being very symptomatic, have a lot of PTSD symptoms, even at one month or three months or six months. And even without treatment, you can move to a place where time has healed the wound or you were able to function effectively in the environment enough so that that becomes background and it doesn't stay in the foreground for you, that you have other things that happen. Maybe you got a job you liked, maybe, um, you know, you had a child or you're preoccupied in a good way with good things that happen in your life. Um, If you've had PTSD for a really long period of time, um, yes, it's possible that it gets less and less severe over time. But usually after like the five or six year mark, if you have sustained PTSD for that long, it's very hard for spontaneous remission to occur. And um, so in someone with severe PTSD that requires, you know, requires medical treatment, what is the sort of stand, what historically, meaning, I don't know, the last say five to 10 years, what, what has the sort of um, standard battery of treatments looked like and how effective have those been overall? Well, the standard battery of treatments for PTSD that are recommended in clinical guidelines Um, really revolve around something called trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy and um, treating with antidepressants medically. Um, In clinical practice, people are using a whole lot of other approaches and a whole lot of other medications. Um, But if you ask an expert, um, what should I do if I have PTSD? they'll probably tell you to try a course of uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, either prolonged exposure or cognitive processing therapy or even EMDR, um, so that you can really process the traumatic uh, memory um, and sort get to the other side where it's not really haunting you, where it's not causing a fear response, where you're not um, organizing your life so that you're avoiding the reminder uh, with, where you can get under get your physiologic symptoms under control and really change um, some of your negative cognitions um, and mood. So that is um, what is recommended by many people. And that is what is offered in many clinical settings. And how common is it for um, different drugs to be diagnosed for PTSD, either for the PTSD itself or um, the common secondary symptoms that might, that might come with that? Well, if you go to a psychiatrist or someone that knows how to prescribe or is licensed to prescribe a drug, an antidepressant or another psychotropic, it's a very good chance that you will be prescribed one. Um, Even though medications are not considered first-line treatments, they're considered second-line treatments, um, or they're considered um, um, appropriate as adjuncts to psychotherapy that need to go along with it. Um, So I think think it's common for people to prescribe um, SSRIs, serotonergic drugs, um, similar to those that are approved for depression for PTSD. Um, they can work for some people. Um, it's, it, it is not the, the normative script that if you just take an antidepressant without talking or talk therapy, um, that you will completely get over your PTSD. But if your symptoms are very physiologic, it might actually help you um, not experience some of the distress at reminders or be able to sleep better or with some of the symptoms. The problem with uh, antidepressant treatment is that more often than not, the symptoms will come back when you go off of the medicine. So it creates this kind of conundrum of how long do I really want to be taking these medicines? Mm -hmm. What are they really doing for me anyway? Um, But on the other hand, there's a real fear of if I stop the medicines, it'll be worse. Um, So, again, we have these treatments, they can work, it depends a lot on 
the nature of what happened, how many symptoms there are, what's going on, what's your comor comorbidity profile look like, um, how well are you functioning overall. So there can be a lot of factors in deciding who gets better. But I would say that a good number of people that have gone to seek treatment for PTSD have been prescribed a medicine at some point in the course of their treatment, unless they have gone to um, a non-MD. Um, but very often, even those um, clinicians will seek to send somebody for pharmacotherapy. I see. Often. Yeah. I see. Um, another interesting area that I know that you've studied is this area of intergenerational trauma. So, you know, someone experiences trauma and, and they have, they have their own experience with that, whatever it may be. And then the offspring of those individuals, the people, you know, their children, for example, um, can apparently be more susceptible to to stress as well. So, can you can you talk a little bit about that? What exactly is intergenerational trauma, and how do you actually study and measure that? So, intergenerational trauma is really um, a misnomer. Hmm. It's, it, it's not that the trauma is past; it's that some of the effects of the trauma from the first generation or the previous generation are past. So. If um, somebody has a traumatic experience, let's say they um, were, I mean, we studied it in Holocaust survivors, so let's take the Holocaust as, as the example. If somebody's a survivor of the Holocaust, that experience is not past. But if the, if the parent became very frightened of the environment um, or had manifestations of PTSD or their worldview changed, you can see a lot of those kinds of things in the second generation. So they somehow in, in, internalize um, a fear or they internalize just um, a feeling about the world, whether it's safe or not. So it's not because they're holding the trauma, but they might be holding some of the, the biology really um, that has to do with responding to the parent. So for many, many years, we thought this was all learned, that you're raised by someone who has a view of the world and they're, and, and they're in charge of how you feel about the world. So if you're holding your mother's hand as a four-year-old and a uniformed policeman is on the next street corner and your body starts to bristle and freeze because to you, a uniformed police officer reminds you of the concentration camps and the Germans, even though not a word has been spoken, the child can get a message about that police officer, right? So that's a, that's, that's a form of transmission of information that will really stay with the child potentially. Um, when we started to do biologic work, in um, adult children of Holocaust survivors, which we did because our initial study showed that they were more likely to develop uh, PTSD, depression, and anxiety compared to Jewish um, demographically matched participants um, in our research. Um, we thought that this vulnerability was strictly behavioral. And even when we began to see things like low cortisol and very similar uh, biology, high adrenaline levels in the offspring of Holocaust survivors, we just thought, again, this is the power of the environment. Uh, but when we started to do epigenetic studies, um, we began to see epigenetic changes in adult offspring of Holocaust survivors that were very interesting, some of which were very similar to things we saw in their parent. Um, but again, these, um, there were different correlates to different epigenetic marks. So some epigenetic marks related to a particular experience um, or, or a parental um, symptom profile, like if the parent had PTSD. But some epigenetic marks were present or absence based on the age of the mother. 
um, or the age of the father at traumatization. So that led us to explore the possibility, which we cannot prove in our human subjects, but is certainly um, something that can be examined in animal models or in prospective studies, um, that trauma affects to um, oocytes or egg or sperm um, might be passed epigenetically down to offspring. And um, the best example that I can give of, of a proof of concept, although there are many, but my perhaps favorite example is the study that was done by Diaz and Ressler, where they took um, male mice and they taught them to fear cherry blossoms. How do you teach a mouse to fear a cherry blossom? Um, you shock them at the same time that they're exposed to a cherry blossom. And pretty soon um, they have a stress response just to the cherry blossom without the shock. Now, um, that experience will result in a series of epigenetic and behavioral changes in the male mouse, in his brain, and in his sperm. Now, if you mate that mouse while they're still afraid of cherry blossoms, the male offspring rodent will have a similar set of epigenetic changes in the brain and sperm, and guess what? They also inexplicably fear cherry blossoms, even without being shocked. So there's definitely um, a story here. Now, if you treat, quote unquote, the um, male mouse by helping them, ex by extinguishing the fear response to the cherry blossom, which you can do by presenting the cherry blossom over and over and over and over again without the shock, and eventually they'll get the message, it wasn't the cherry blossom, then you can obliterate that um, epigenetic response in the male offspring and, the, and also the behavioral response. So I think that that is really a very interesting story and what we have also come to learn in our epigenetic work is that a lot of white, what might get quote unquote transmitted might be part of the um, machinery that is associated with resilience. That might be associated with the parent's ability to cope and survive that trauma. So that while there is definitely um, a case to be made for having biologic changes, um, that come from a parental experience or the response of the parent to that experience, these are not necessarily um, responses that are negative. Because just as the stress response is not intrinsically negative, it's there to help you cope, um, the intergenerational effects might similarly be there for that purpose, might be like a shorthand transmission or communication about the kind of dangers that your offspring might have to undergo. And in that sense, it's adaptive. Where people start experiencing a lot of the vulnerability is often when there's a mismatch between what their bodies are ready to do with the lives that they're prepared to lead and their actual environment. So if you're, if you're um, built for war, if you have a, a constitution that is all about fearing the environment and being hypervigilant and you live in peacetime, you're going to be that, that person that is always anxious and always, one, always thinking that the other shoe is going to drop even when there's no reason in the current environment to um, feel threatened, but you don't know where it's coming from. And that's why I think people really resonate with this idea, because they walk around with doom and gloom, even though they don't have an exact explanation from their own lives, but it's a real feeling. I want to go back to the mouse example here and, and dig into this a little bit. So you said there's a result where you just do Pavlovian conditioning in an animal. You pair some innocuous stimulus like a cherry blossom with something bad like a shock. And you know, kind of like Pavlov's dogs, the mouse learns to fear the otherwise innocuous sensory uh, element of their environment. And that this association can actually be passed down through what sounds like an epigenetic inheritance mechanism. So I want to do two things here. One, I want to I want to understand how robust that result is, and two, I want to make it clear for people what we mean by epigenetics here. So so towards the beginning you mentioned methylation, but can you talk a little bit about the basics of epigenetics and how that's 
actually measured? Well, you can measure epigenetic marks because they're just molecules and you can measure them on the DNA location that you would like to go to, which is maybe a specific transcription factor on a specific gene or on, on a location of a gene. You can also use an array where you can get like an overview sampling of uh, methylation marks on kind of, I wouldn't say random because probably a lot of thought went into the selection of which parts of which gene, um, but you can get like an overview by doing what we call an epigenome wide um, array where somebody's prepared a, a lot of different um, genes and um, allow you to look at methylation on a lot of those genes. And so methyl, a methyl group is simply a carbon group with three hydrogens. It, it can, if it attaches to one of the bases of the DNA, the cytosine base, it changes the cytosine into 5-methyl cytosine, and this impedes transcription. It will have consequences for, for um, trans, transcription and then translation. So you won't have as much um, messenger RNA or protein. So in effect, having a methyl group land on a cytosine base is a form of perhaps silencing the gene or having a methyl group removed is a form of having that gene be overactive, you can measure it. There are also other things you can look at methylation in histones, you can look at acetylation. And there are about 80 methylation marks. And how does a methyl mark get on a location of a gene or in the histone or in the chromatin? Well, that has to do with the fact that there is a very active and dynamic environment going on in the cell nucleus. And so when we say that the environment affects methylation, what we're really saying is like a whole lot of chemical reactions are going on in the nucleus of the cell. Chemical reactions are when two things combined and in the presence of an enzyme, two other things are formed. And very common methyl groups are, for, are the byproducts of other chemical reactions and they're present in the environment. And in the presence of the right enzyme, we want to emphasize that, not just a random party. Um, there you can affect the way that your genes are expressed either by having the mark on the dna not in the dna but on the dna or in the histones so that the genes become either easier to read or harder to read as a result of chromatin being condensed which makes it hard to read or open which makes it easy to read if you, if you don't know molecular biology, I don't want to make it too technical because there, it doesn't add to make it technical. It actually doesn't add. So, you know, when I first started talking about epigenetics, I would have absurdly simple metaphors, um, like imagine your hair being wound up in a hair curler, right? The tighter the curl, you know, the more it's going to hold um, because <laughs> the environment isn't going to be able to loosen it as much. Um, so if you have your um, uh, DNA very tightly wound around the histone, um, that'll make it harder to read, um, harder um, to read the instruction. But if you open it up, um, then you have a, a greater chance of affecting the uh, recipe, so to speak. So th the environment can change our genes. That being said, it's actually a really complicated thing because not all genes can be are subject to epigenetic to changes through environmental epigenetic regulation. I mean, no event in the environment is going to change the color of your eyes. Mm -hmm. For example, so this pertains to mostly, I think, stress-related genes and immune processes. And it's not, it's, not, um, it's not a function of every mark can change every gene expression. It has to really be in the exact right location. And a lot of other things have to be in place. But why people like epigenetics is because we didn't have a language for this before. Um, even if you don't know the specifics of what is happening, you use the term epigenetics, a lot of people use it, because it's a shorthand for something happened that provided a change that is more enduring and transformative than it should otherwise have had. And there's a biologic reality that correlates with that. 
Um, we only had before transient hormones that come back to baseline, right? And genes that are rigid and don't really change. And now we have this middle thing that, oh, I can make a change that is enduring. I didn't say permanent, but enduring. That will survive at least cell division. When a cell is dividing and it has an epigenetic mark from a traumatic event stuck on it, those two daughter cells will also have that epigenetic mark. So this is a way to produce sustained transformative effects. Are there many, many, many more questions than answers at this point? Absolutely. I think the problem that I've experienced, at least, is that there's so many questions that we can't make it as simple as people want it to be. Um, there's a lot of individual variation. The only thing that I think we can say for sure is that we have a proof of concept that environmental effects can result in enduring changes. And because of that, we have a mandate to make sure our environments are as um, healthy and good as possible so that we can um, counteract results of adversity. And I point to a study, you know, our work is really um, for the last 15 years, maybe even now longer, has been about trying to understand biologic changes before and after therapy, psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy. And we've looked at epigenetics, epigenetic changes, um, just in response to psychotherapy to see whether or not some things change on stress-related genes and some things do change. Hmm. So the good news is, what we do after a trauma really matters. And we're not just stuck in the muck of our own bad experiences and all of the bad experiences of prior generations. And that at some point, we're going to have to look at some of the things that we may have gotten that are ill-fitting for our current circumstances as attempts to kind of warn us <laughs> or prepare us for adversities that maybe we don't experience and that that preparation um, can cannot land well and impede us if we don't kind of um, take heed of it. So it's it's just a very important um, thing to make sure people don't walk away thinking that they're doomed mm -hmm. because trauma is bad and intergenerational trauma is bad and I don't have a chance because that's not what this work is about. This work is about the fact that we can change and optimize our performance. We can create in our own bodies. We can go from an iPhone version 10 to an 11 to a 12. <laughs> we don't have to buy a new one of ourselves each time at the Apple store. We have the, the innate capability of providing positive transformational changes. And it's really, um, you know, it's a superpower, not a prison. I see. So, so in terms of the epigenetics here you know when there's an epigenetic change to dna if i'm following the the dna code itself the sequence of letters in the code is not actually changing but right. these small chemical modifications are happening to some genes under some circumstances some that genes. that can allow that can change the expression of those genes maybe they get more wound up and they don't they don't go on to then cause a protein to get made so it can have an effect on which genes are turned on and off and that's interesting in itself. Um, it doesn't happen to every gene, as you say. It seems to be only for certain genes, and you have to be in the right context. But you did say this can be enduring, meaning if uh, an epigenetic modification happens in a sperm cell, in the male mouse example we were talking about, it can endure for some number of generations. So there actually is an inheritance mechanism here whereby you know the male mouse exposed to the, the Pavlovian conditioning of being afraid of the cherry blossoms there is this kind of epigenetic change in some genes in its DNA. If that happens in the sperm, he can actually pass that on to his male rodent offspring such that they, upon first exposure to that cherry blossom, are actually showing this, this fear response. Yeah, but the most important part of the story was the fact that if you fear condition that male, those things won't be passed. So what do we do with our young men that come home from war? Hopefully, we can treat their PTSD uh, so, that, so that we can contain this. Um, the reason why um, you know, we found epigenetic changes 
particularly associated with maternal age in Holocaust offspring, meaning if your mother was before puberty when exposed to the Holocaust, you tended to have more um, of an epigenetic change in one of the stress-related genes, is because in females, you know, they're born with all of their oocytes. You know, that this is a time when um, women might be most vulnerable to having things being written on their on their gametes, on their sex cells. Um, but again, a lot of this stuff is simply um, not that well worked out. The, but the, the most important part of the story is that, yes, things can be transmitted, but current environments can also counteract the effects of some of these things that are transmitted. So the idea of, of understanding intergenerational effects isn't to doom us mm -hmm. it's to understand that we have power if we have if, if we exert appropriate counter control over our environment and not just let chaos and trauma control our biology but also let healing environments and good reactions to trauma also predominate then this might be a way for us to overcome adversity. I mean, that's the real message. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I really hope that that comes through because, you know, it's so titillating to focus on, you know, the horrible effects of trauma. Um, but no one ever promised us a rose garden. I mean, animals are constantly fighting for their survival. And, you know, what makes us think that we wouldn't have adversity or we wouldn't have to fight for our survival too. We do, in fact. Um, but if we're smart about it, we can be very thoughtful about the, the lessons that we learn from this and the environments that we create so that when we are exposed to trauma, and I say when because statistics tell us that almost every single one of us will be exposed to a traumatic event in our lifetime. And 25% would be exposed to more than three of these events. I mean, that's, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So I say when, and so we have to be prepared for it by um, not being so stunned, like what just happened? How could this happen? By, uh, by building stress resilience, by understanding what the appropriate responses are to adversity, by understanding how to support other people who have um, been exposed to adversity. I, I think these are these are all really important conversations that we need to start having, especially since as we speak today, you know, we're just going from one adversity of a coronavirus and global pandemic to another adversity of the Ukraine situation war, the Russian war on Ukraine, and the creation of millions of refugees and traumatized people. Um, it, it doesn't seem like we catch much of a break in terms of a release from trauma. So we have to do what we can do on the other end to ask how can we how can we prevent long term consequences or treat them. I see. So in a moment, I want to move on to some of the research that you and others are doing on new tools for for overcoming trauma and new new strategies that are being used and tried in the clinic. I want to ask one last question to make sure I'm understanding that mouse result. So okay. because this, this is a remarkable result, if this is true, you're saying that you can train a mouse to associate a cherry blossom or something with a negative outcome, they'll exhibit a fear response, and then their offspring will also exhibit that fear response with no prior conditioning. They will automatically exhibit that on the first exposure to the stimulus. According to what I read, Dia, uh, Brian Diaz and Carrie Ressler, wonderful, wonderful investigators, a uh, paper that I believe appeared in Nature Neuroscience. Um, but yes, that is my understanding. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's qu quite a and there's a lot. There's a lot of other work that, that have, have been done um, in the laboratory of Tracy Bale and Isabel Mansui. I mean, there's some some extraordinary scientists that are working on animal uh, models of this. We, we don't do animal work, um, but this is really a, a, a very extraordinary um, series of studies. So some things may be more transmissible than others, but there's definitely 
um, something to look at here and mechanisms to look at about how these things get transmitted through microRNA. I mean, the biology is very complicated, but many people are working on this. Hmm. Interesting. So let's start discussing now, you know, the the effectiveness that some have seen in, in some very dramatic results that, that go back a number of years now with MDMA for treating things like PTSD. So can you summarize where that research is at and, and why exactly we think a drug like this is so um, potentially effective for this kind of disorder? Right, so there's a lot of excitement about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So the first thing that I wanna say about this is that it's not the drug, it's the drug plus the psychotherapy. And that's maybe the most important thing I'm gonna say about MDMA, um, because the, the drug taken not in the context of a therapeutic process has very different effects. Um, known as molly and ecstasy when they're taken at a rave or at a party um, or at a festival they don't cure your ptsd right or even reduce the symptoms of it the idea is to recognize that for a lot of people talking about traumatic experiences in therapy is extremely distressing mm. um, shameful a lot of times when the um, traumatic experience is not clear cut, such as that person was the clear perpetrator and I was the clear victim. That's clear cut. But in, in many, many kinds of traumatic experiences, there's a lot of room for self doubt and self blame or guilt like, yeah, but it was four in the morning, a, a woman might say and might feel that she's partially to blame or feel very ashamed that she left herself open in the situation. Now in cognitive behavioral therapy, we work very, very hard to make it, to make sure the woman knows that that did not give anyone the license to rape her. That's not her fault. Um, but still, it's very hard to penetrate deep into the reservoir of shame combat, right? You do a lot of things including um, killing the enemy that you might have some really serious feelings about um, when you come home. And, um, and so when you do this work in therapy, it might be too distressing for you to do it. And now the conventional model is, well, let me send you to a psychiatrist who will prescribe this antidepressant that we talked about earlier. And that's not a bad idea, except that the antidepressant can work too well and end up numbing you um, so that you cannot have the right emotional engagement with the trauma that you need to have in order to really make a breakthrough um, that you need to make in order to get to rid yourself of this idea that you are to blame, you know. Maybe you see yourself as a five-year-old who was sexually abused and you see how tiny you were and that it's not in your cognitive mind that you could have prevented it. Um, so when you take a medicine with psychotherapy, you might be too numb to engage. When you try to do trauma-focused work without the medicine, it may be too distressing. You need a special kind of therapist to stick with you. Um, through this, but a lot of people really find it hard. And so there are a lot of dropouts to this kind of therapy and many therapists revert back to sort of, let's step back. We could talk about other things. We don't have to talk about the trauma, which is fine and helpful, but it doesn't necessarily reduce somebody's PTSD. Um, why I was attracted to the idea of MDMA assisted psychotherapy was because I came to understand that the purpose of the MDMA is to act as a heart opener to increase self-compassion primarily, um, to allow a, one to access, you know, better insight, increases interpersonal trust with the therapists, and really put you in a position where you can be, and we call this the right window of tolerance, for being able to process uh, distressing events without being too um, aroused or distressed 
um, by your own memories. And so that can cause a, a deep sense of agitation and it does, do, it, it, and person could be worse. I mean, imagine you're trying to, to, to ex excavate a tumor and you cut them without, without anesthesia. And the, the pain of making that incision is so great that you don't even have a chance to reach in and grab the tumor. And they say, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't even get to sew them up, but you certainly don't get anywhere near the tumor. So the idea is, could this approach that really um, puts you in a little different altered frame of mind, an altered state of consciousness, can that help? Now, when I first heard about it, I thought, you know, it sounds good but PTSD is a really tough condition to treat. But the results of the phase two and the first phase three trial have been really, really good and amazing. And already after the um, phase two trials, I thought this is worth a try at our, um, certainly at, at our VA and in our trauma center um, we have been working on for the last 10 years some ideas around using cortisol as an augmentation of therapy um, and as a preventer of therapy. And we really thought that because we understood the cortisol biology so well and the receptor biology so well, that we could develop cortisol-based treatments, which we tried to do, I would say, for a good 20 years. Um, but that's not, but, but they don't really work. We, we have one a uh, study now where we're hopeful that a high dose of cortisol can prevent PTSD if you give it in, within four hours of a trauma. Mm. Um, that's a different issue. But, you know, we tried augmenting regular psychotherapy with cortisol. We tried doing a lot of the things that we thought might um, work and be helpful. So I was already very inclined and, and very um, positively inclined towards a model where the purpose of giving a medication is to assist a psychotherapeutic process and not to avoid it. Um, so MDMA checked that box. And then I thought, well, let's, let's see how it works. Um, also, since we have been doing so much research on molecular mechanisms of psychotherapy and treatment and PTSD, let's see whether um, these outcomes actually change something biological and people that have PTSD, or if we can predict, um, such as, of course, epigenetics or brain function, um, or can we predict um, who should, who will respond to um, a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy um, if they have a certain kind of biologic um, uh, situation in place. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of work we decided to do. Um, I came home talking about this to, to my team. And I mean, it wasn't even hard. It, people were so excited about the idea. Um, we also decided that we would establish a training program, which we've been able to do for other clinicians, um, especially we just did a training um, partnered with MAPS uh, for uh, VA clinicians and um, or clinicians that work with veterans, I should say, it, they were they were not just people that work in VAs. Um, but the idea is to give this a try and to see how it works in a population that really is a very high util utilizer of healthcare dollars for PTSD and that seems to have chronic needs and also is a very safe place to conduct this kind of research because we're here, we're not going anywhere. So we're able to kind of fully address um, the needs of our patients. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're doing. And we're, we're all very excited about the potential and the opportunity to learn even more about what the true, you know, object of, of therapy is and the the therapeutic targets are. Mm -hmm. I love the analogy you drew with surgery, where you know if you have a tumor in your body, the cure for that is to have a surgeon literally cut you open and cut out the tumor. But in order for that to even be possible in the first place, you have to uh, 
there has to be something enabling that to happen. And, and in the case of surgery, it's a literal anesthetic, something that puts you to sleep so that you don't experience the pain so that the actual cure, the surgery can happen. And so the analogy with MDMA assisted psychotherapy is that psychotherapy is like emotional surgery. It's the thing that's actually going to get in there and remove the problem, but you need this enablement tool. And that tool puts you into some kind of physiological state that enables the the surgeon to actually get in there and remove the tumor, so to speak. Can you speak a little bit about what the MDMA is doing physiologically? What is the state that someone is being put in? And is it impacting things like adrenaline and cortisol and, and other things involved in stress? Yeah, absolutely. So the MDMA is a triple, um, uh, a triple neurotransmitter releaser. It's releasing gobs and gobs of serotonin. It's preventing serotonin reuptake back into the neuron. It's releasing dopamine, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who has, who calls it ecstasy. And it releases also um, adrenal norepinephrine um, and it also um, causes the release of several hormones. Interestingly, cortisol levels are increased with um, acute MDMA, mm. um, prolactin, vasopressin, oxytocin, um, which probably helps with the interpersonal trust and the self-compassion. Um, so you're really in this neurochemical storm that is, a, a, in a good way, <laughs> um, that is really um, giving you an opportunity um, to do something that you can't really do in a different state or not as easily or not as continuously. And I think another secret ingredient, it's just my opinion, I have no proof of this, but I think another um, secret weapon of this secret ingredient of this treatment is the long sessions, which I think are um, just really conducive to allowing people to explore. And sometimes it takes a little time to get to the real heart of the matter. And often people report that the, that what we call the focal trauma, the, the trauma that caused their current PTSD is only one event to process, but that they find other events, maybe not as objectively traumatic, but nonetheless, very, very salient in their, um, in their own lives and in their own pasts, um, rejections by parents or at school or bullying or, um, you know, loss of, of a loved one at an early age when people probably thought they were too young to be involved in a grieving process or, you know, maybe um, other forms of abuse or neglect. And so, you know, the long session really allows you to kind of find, find those doors that you slam shut and makes you less fearful about opening those doors and seeing how they just contribute to the whole. So it's a beautiful um, theory. The results of early studies are very promising. I've been a, um, a researcher for a very long time in PTSD. So I am prepared for the fact that not everybody, um, that this treatment is not for everybody, but I think it's really important to to learn for whom <laughs> it is contraindicated. And um, like in every other treatment known to man, there is no treatment for any disorder or condition that can be unilaterally applied without having some people not respond to it. So I think that, um, and we're, we're just very well positioned um, from the biologic aspect um, to kind of do the work that some, sometimes is less interesting to people. Um, I heard a speaker yesterday on psychedelics and someone asked how it worked, just what you asked me. And they said, it doesn't matter, it works. I don't need to concern myself with that. But I think that um, our field does need to concern itself with that. No individual has to concern themselves with that for sure. But that if the psychedelic renaissance is going to succeed, we need some facts. We need to understand the mechanisms um, many effects of MDMA are very similar to effects of traditional antidepressants, except traditional antidepressants don't work as quickly. They ultimately do the same kind of things to neural architecture, but there's something about being able to do them fast, some kind of reopening of a critical window of plasticity or 
something that is occurring rapidly that is enabling another process to unfold that may unfold more gradually. So we've been doing what we've been doing in psychiatry for years and years and decades and decades. And this is really a new model. It's not just a new compound. It's a real, it's really a new model of being able to use a medicine, not just to reverse something that you might, that might be altered. And again, back to my <laughs> big idea that what's altered isn't necessarily what's broken. It can be to, to use the analogy of infection and white blood cells. When you have an infection, you have high white blood cells. That's how infection is diagnosed. The last thing you want to do is kill off those white blood cells. When you have an infection, mm. they're the messenger. Mm. So many of the biologic changes that occur in stress or even in psychiatric illness, we have to be sure we're not killing off the white blood cells. And maybe treatment involves facilitating new processes. Maybe the way to get over a trauma isn't to restore yourself to who you were, but to build something new on that ground. And maybe that's what this neuroplasticity idea is about, not just restoration, but rebuilding. And um, I think that when you talk to trauma survivors who have gotten over that hump, that's what they'll tell you. They'll say that old person doesn't exist anymore, but I was able to take what happened to me and use it as best as I can towards something positive. That's what I think the human condition is. And I, I don't want to pathologize it too much, but I also don't want to, um, um, you know, stigmatize people who haven't gotten there yet because it's such a difficult thing to do. The body is fighting you tooth and nail to achieve that place of greater resilience. And so we must make that easier and we must help. But ultimately, I believe that it is achievable and that psychedelic assisted psychotherapy may be one route for it. And so we're putting a lot of effort into that in case that's true. Um, we would definitely want to be part of um, knowing that we contributed some scientific knowledge to, to help, help make it more widespread if, um, should these medications become approved, which seems to be the trajectory right now. Mm -hmm. What, um, what are some of the major areas of research that, that you and your lab are currently pursuing? Well, um, let's see, what are the big things? So uh, the last three or four years, uh, let's say four years, we have been pursuing, um, we've always been interested in biomarkers and not only in measuring things um, that are obvious, but also in trying to create methodologies to measure things that are more difficult. Uh, so we have um, made a lot of improvements in current blood biomarkers where you just take a blood sample and start measuring a bunch of hormones or neurochemicals or whatever you want to measure. And we have added to that um, this idea of like an in vivo component where you can take blood samples, blood, you, you can take blood cells from people keep them alive, create lymphocytes, and then incubate the live blood cells with stress hormones, and then look at all of the um, neurochemicals and genes that are expressed in response to stimulation of the blood to stress hormones as a way of mimicking PTSD um, in a dish. And then we have also taken the same strategies to see if we could model PTSD vulnerability in um, pluripotent, in, 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 um, in neurons that are induced neurons from pluripotent stem cells that are created from skin cells. Um, so we're very excited about that work. That is, we're currently hopefully negotiating final stages for paper in a very good journal um, that really has been able to use this preparation to show that in PTSD, there might be some gene by environment interactions that contribute to vulnerability, but that you won't see it just if you look at static genes alone. You have to stimulate those genes in neurons with stress hormones in order to really get this gene by environment interaction in a dish, and then be able to um, really learn 
a lot about, because this is definitely a before, because they're embryonic stem cells from live donors. So that's been something that we're, you know, the most exciting science, I think, that um, we've done. And we, we are very keen on um, applying it to psychedelic work by, use, by seeing if we can use those neurons as a platform for screening effects of different psychedelic drugs on people before they're administered with the caveat that we know that the psychotherapy component is important but still it would be a very interesting thing for us to examine so that's one major thing i, I think i told you a little about the study that we're doing um, funded by the department of defense as was the other study um, looking to see if we could prevent uh, ptsd from happening by um, administering very large doses of hydrocortisone um, in the emergency room during the golden hours compared to placebo. So that's a trial that we have ongoing right now. Um, we have other trials in our group, uh, people studying ways to treat moral injury, um, people uh, studying um, the effects of PTSD on sexuality, people doing brain imaging studies in relation to um, standard therapies like prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy. Um, so. Uh, 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 we're setting up to do natural language processing in connection with how your narration of trauma changes with psychedelic medicine. So, um, yeah, I think we're doing a lot of things. It's fun. <laughs> it's a, it, keeps, <laughs> it keeps us busy. <laughs> are, are you studying any other substances beyond MDMA, some, uh, some of the um, classical psychedelics, for example, that are being used in, in other trials? We're, we're going to be starting a psilocybin trial very soon. Yeah, we're, we're, um, w once we get rolling in the center, um, we're going to try to study other compounds and maybe try to even study, depending on FDA approval status, um, combinations of uh, psychedelics. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're keeping our eye out for um, drugs that are not that that already have a signal that they may be valuable mm -hmm. in mental health disorders um so there are a lot of compounds being developed and discovered but i think that we want to maybe look at some of the ones that we know something about in order to decrease you know adverse adverse effects i see well uh, Dr. Yehud, I want to be respectful of your time. Is there anything you want to say to wrap up? Any kind of any any major points you want to resummarize or emphasize for people before we sign off here? Oh gosh, no. If you've if you've gone this far, God bless you. This is a long podcast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening. All right. Well, Dr. Rachel Yehuda, thank you for your time. Okay.